Well, welcome back for the last um, section of this conference. Uh, now, just to show you that despite uh, we working on Puritanism, we are not so um, zealous when it comes to time. We are running slightly uh, uh, behind, but we will uh, be uh, uh, uber zealous and try to catch up. Now, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Jackie Eels, who is Professor Emerita at Canterbury Christ Church University in Kent. Um, Jackie um, is the author of two uh, important uh, books. Um, one uh, titled Women in Early Modern England, which was published by Rowledge, and uh, one on the 17th century Puritan uh, family, the Harleys, um, called, titled Puritans and Roundheads, published by Cambridge University Press. Jackie um, has a um, large number of publications on the Civil War, on the English Civil Wars, and it's my great pleasure to um, have her here uh, speak. Now, one quick practical issue. Um, Jackie will uh, speak for about 25 minutes, and then um, since the next speaker, uh, Alec Ryrie, is not here yet, uh, we will have to see whether we start immediately with questions uh, for Jackie, or if not, if Alec arrives in the, in the meantime, we will then uh, uh, let Alec do his 25 minutes presentation and then collect questions uh, at the end. Thank you, Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk to you this morning. And uh, I'd also like to thank this morning's panel because I hope to build on their remarks with some of my examples and yesterday's contributors as well. So 40 years ago, Richard L. Greaves published an article in Church History outlining the role of women in early Puritanism, particularly in their clandestine underground activities. He drew attention to women members of separatist or independent churches from 1568 onwards, to women who provided domestic sanctuary for Puritan ministers, to female patrons and authors, and to women who were fined and imprisoned for their Puritanism. And the slide you can see behind me, I might have to stand up just to gesture at it for you. It's from 1648, but it shows you two different congregations. So on the left, you've got the Orthodox true minister, and on the right, the seducer and false prophet. Now, this is wonderful because the minister in his pulpit in the church has got this wonderful audience of rational men stroking their beards and considering his words, his sermon. But over here, we've got the false prophet sectary. And look at his congregation. They are boys and women. And this is one of the accusations against ministers and women that there is a sort of undertow of ignorant women and boys who follow these charismatic preachers. And you can see he's preaching from a tavern, the Bell Tavern, and there's a very naughty boy here trying to peer up the <coughs> lady's skirt. So the whole thing has a sort of sexual undertone, which I'll come back to. So Greaves concluded that more research was needed in the ways in which women sustained the Puritan movement from the beginning of Elizabeth's reign until the outbreak of the English Civil War in the 1640s. And although much work has been published since Greaves' article, there are still barriers to studying women's religious leanings since they are not always visible in the historical record. Now, in a short paper such as this, I shall concentrate my remarks to the early Stuart period, while also drawing on some later material looking back to the pre-Civil War period. First, though, I want to consider some of the problems we have in identifying women as Puritans, because we do not have any of the other obvious reference points for their religious beliefs that we can use for men. For example, sermons, speeches, committee membership in Parliament. Much writing by women has been lost as well, as sometimes it just wasn't preserved because it wasn't seen as important. Some women were very modest, some Puritan women said, you know, destroy my writing, it's secret writing, don't want anyone to see it. 
sometimes it gets published because it's discovered after the woman's death in a cabinet or something and the husband is so proud and so wants to feed this into the Puritan tradition that he takes no notice of the wife's modesty and publishes. Now let's take an example, a very well-known example, the Puritan Lady Margaret Hovey. In the early 17th century, she created a range of religious writing, including meditations, a testament, a commonplace book, and sermon notes. Now that's the sort of thing that gets historians really excited because you can draw parallels between this different type of writing. We've got that for Nehemiah Wallington, but we don't have all of those documents for Lady Margaret Hobie. Only her diary from 1599 to 1605 has survived. And it gives us an insight into what those other documents might have contained. Now, sometimes these writings by women were shared amongst family groups or wider networks. And a really good example of this comes from the later 17th century, the spiritual writing of Sarah Savage. So she was the daughter of the nonconformist minister, Philip Henry. And I think Alex Walsh mentioned the Henrys yesterday as a, a dynastic clerical family. And her writing dates the late 17th and early 18th century. And they were circulated within her family. So we get different types of documents. We get some in her own handwriting, some copies. Now, some of those copies of the original writing are in our archives today in the Dr. Williams Library, for example, Chester Record Office. But excitingly, some are still in the hands of family members. And we're not talking about a great gentry family, a great aristocratic family with an archive. We're talking about the descendants of a dissenting minister, but they still have these original writings in her handwriting. So this conference is looking at transformations, the transformations of Puritanism. And today I want to consider how women sustained Puritan traditions within their family and religious networks in the early Stuart period. In some ways, this served to domesticate Puritanism, make it look less threatening and more respectable, especially after the early challenges that it had posed in Elizabeth's reign. Yet for women, I think, there were still tensions in relation to their beliefs, and their Puritanism is often revealed at points when women were involved in the rituals of the life cycle at baptism, marriage, and death. There is, of course, I think, a marked switch after 1640. From 1640 onwards, differences in opinion about theology, church polity, become much more hard line amongst Puritan groupings. So before 1640, there's a kind of fuzzy edge around these differences. The 1640s and 50s saw renewed challenges to the status quo from women who acted as spiritual leaders and preachers particularly in the independent congregations or the sects. Yet even in this revolutionary period, no one argued for a church ministry by women. So it goes so far that it stops. Anne Lawrence has attributed the prominence of women activists in the 1640s, such as the leveller Catherine Chidley and the preacher Mrs Attaway, to their shock value in ignoring the Pauline injunctions to remain silent in church. Phyllis Mack has identified no more than 300 women who acted as preachers, writers, uh, evangelical missionaries, prophets in the 1640s and 50s. So we're not dealing with a big group either. I think women's involvement as activists, of course, mirrors what has been termed the fortunes of English Puritanism with phases of conflict with authority and periods of accommodation. How then do we identify those women who were not activists as Puritans? Peter Lake, we've already heard about Peter Lake's work in this conference, has described Puritanism as a certain style of piety, while Patrick Collinson considered that rigorous Sabbath observance and religious fasting were both hallmarks of that Puritan style. I think that this made Puritan women very visible to their contemporaries because of their participation in these communal activities, which allowed the godly to exclude the ungodly from their company. 
And it goes back to what Cesare was saying earlier about Puritans being noisy neighbors as well, singing psalms. You just can't ignore that kind of thing going on next door. The ultimate expression of this exclusion can be found in the independent or separatist churches, which are set up by Puritan immigrants to Germany and the Low Countries in the early 17th century, and then later in New England. As we've heard, entry to those churches often required a member to provide evidence of the lively workings of God on their religious belief. References to these spiritual struggles often emerged in funeral sermons or other publications marking the death of a believer. One such striking account concerns Susanna Bell, a London merchant's wife who emigrated with her husband and children in the 1630s to New England, only to return to London in the 1640s. So this is Susanna Bell's testimony from 1673. And uh, let me just give you an explanation. This is published at the um, Wish of Her Son. And it, it has this introduction by Thomas Brooks, an independent minister. And it's her account of her life, but expressed through spiritual values. So Susanna found it very hard to discern active signs of her faith when she emigrated to New England. She was only admitted to a congregation there after a year of soul searching. And this is what she says about that process. I was brought into a very sad condition for I did not experimentally know what it was to have oil in my lamp like the wise virgin. She's referring to the wise and foolish virgins in the New Testament grace in my heart, nor what it was to have union with Christ, that being a mystery to me. So she feels locked out from this experimental predestinarian uh, experience. And then I did think myself guilty of breaking all of the commandments of God, except the sixth. So this is this Puritan anxiety coming out. Have I broken the commandments? Is God no longer in union with me? How is this going to end? Her spiritual memoirs also contain a strong attachment to interpreting the Bible as having special providential meaning in her own life. Now, this is not unusual. Uh, works of Puritan practical devotion advised lay readers to look for evidences of God's working in their lives. When did God sustain you? When did God lead you in a problem? And this is what she does all the way through the book. And although it's not unusual, I think the familiarity with the Bible, the ability to pull out a quote that relates to your own situation is very impressive. It's quite remarkable. So when a fire threatened her home in New England, she was reminded of verses from the book of Isaiah, particularly Isaiah 43, 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So her home was spared in this conflagration and she saw it as the hand of God. Now in contrast to these very positive uh, explications of Puritan belief by Puritans, in 1628, John Earl, the future bishop, had satirized Puritan women like Bell as hypocrites in his hostile character of a she precise. Now, interestingly, he doesn't use the word Puritan about her at all. She is a she precise hypocrite. And she overflows so with the Bible that she spills it upon every occasion and will not cudgel her maids without scripture. Now, Earl's description was part of the fashion at the time for writing ironic pen portraits or stereotypes based on the classical characters of the Greek philosopher Theophrastus. Earl's Puritan is a tradesman's wife and a nonconformist who prefers preaching to prayer and on Sunday walks five miles to hear a preacher gadding to another sermon outside her parish when she could just go to her parish church. Nothing angers her more than the fact that women cannot preach. 
although she makes up for this at her dinner table when she talks against sense and against antichrist. So we've got these words that Cesare was talking about as well, that she's constantly talking, quoting the Bible, spilling out words, almost preaching, but in her home. So in contrast to that, let's look at Lady Mary Veer. Yes. Okay. This is Lady Mary Veer, and uh, this is taken from Samuel Clarke's great omnibus con uh, collection of the godly lives of Puritans, published in 1683. So the lives of sundry eminent persons in this later age. So she's lumped together with Puritan clerics, Puritan gentlemen, there are about 10 women who are commemorated in this way. And what Clark did was he took the part of their funeral sermon that dealt just with their lives. He didn't bother with the rest of the funeral sermon that was the uh, explication of a religious text, but he just took the last few pages and reprinted them in these great omnibus editions. And they're a great favorite with historians of Puritanism because they give you an insight into what Puritans did. We must assume that these are, uh, they're generic, so they've got a certain style of being written, but at the same time, they have to be individual to make them recognizable. And, and Puritans were into authenticity as well in biography. So this portrait is actually taken from an earlier publication, which I'll be talking about um, from 1672, her funeral sermon. But you can see Lady Mary Beard died at the age of 91, she is the ancient mother in our Israel to the Puritans, and she is very soberly dressed, isn't she, with a ruff. There's actually another portrait of her um, in existence when she was younger, which shows her more fashionably dressed with a lower neckline, but obviously as a widow, she's now dressed in a very respectable way. So here's Mary Lady Vere, and she was described approvingly in 1649 by one of her admirers, the cleric John Jerry, as an ancient mother in our Israel for her long service to God after the way that has been called Puritanism. Now those two descriptions, John Earl's character and Jerry's uh, approach to Mary Vere, uh, lie at the extremes of the activities of Puritan women and they raise questions about how we label women as Puritans if they are not activists. So we learned from Veer's funeral sermon printed in 1672 that she had a long-standing reputation as a supporter of the international Calvinist cause. She was born in 1581. She was old enough to remember the Spanish Armada 1588, which made her a very good Protestant. She married Sir Horace Vere in 1607, and he was one of the great yeah. war heroes of the Dutch wars against the Spanish in the 1620s and 30s. And her home as a married woman and as a widow was a model of household religion. She worshipped in private and with her family and servants. She employed Puritan chaplains. She had five daughters. She instructed them and her servants in religious learning. Diane Willen considers that this level of household devotion was always confined to a minority who had both the time and the resources. Now, Veer was also a patron, defender, and promoter of Puritan clergymen, including John, Doug, John Dodd, who uh, similarly lived to a great age, uh, 90, I think, was still alive at the beginning of the Civil War and could remember the early days of. Uh, Puritan activism, and John Davenport, who emigrated to New England in 1637. Now, as a woman of high status, Mary Vere was undoubtedly the acceptable face of Puritanism. She was the sister-in-law of the Secretary of State, Sir Edward Conway, from 1623 to 28, he served as uh, Secretary of State to Charles, uh, James I, then Charles I, and as I said, the widow of Sir Horace Vere, the hero of the Dutch Wars. And Sir Horace is buried in Westminster Abbey, so it gives you an idea of how high status the family are. She was also the mother-in-law of Sir Thomas Fairfax, the commander-in-chief of Parliament's New Model Army during the Civil Wars. And she retained the admiration of the Presbyterian dissenters after her death in 1672 
at the age of 91. So this is why uh, this publication comes around 10 years later. Now, in contrast, Earl's she precise hypocrite is of a different social class and manner altogether. Earl imagines her dressed in a ruff made from pages of the Geneva Bible, a translation favored by Puritans. She is tainted by antinomianism, counting nothing as vices, but superstition and an oath, and thinks adultery a less sin than to swear by my truly. Because the term Puritan originated as a term of abuse, it is naturally difficult to find anyone, man or woman, who claimed to be a Puritan at the time. Luckily, however, we do have one <laughs> example. So we've got an unusually positive and helpful character of a Puritan from 1621, showing that this Puritan feeling of being outside the mainstream of politics has already started. It, it predates Charles I's reign. And this is the counterpoint to Earl's satire, and it deserves, I think, to be better known to historians. This unpublished character was written by the leading Puritan gentleman and member of parliament, Sir Robert Harley, after another member of parliament had viciously attacked a proposed law for Sunday observance. Now, Harley was all, um, already a part of Mary Vere's religious and family networks. And two years later, he marries her niece, Brilliana Conway, who shared his convictions. And for Brilliana, we've got a commonplace book, which is entirely composed of her religious reading, Calvin, William Perkins, and so on. Uh, we've also got her letters, uh, particularly from 1638, when the Scottish Wars start, into 1643, when she dies. And she is really you know, a hotter sort of Protestant. She wants to see the bishops fall. And she hopes that in, but very early on, 1641, I think, that once the bishops begin to fall, they fall indeed. It's not just, you know, they're going to be given less work to do. They're going to disappear altogether. Now, Har the Harley's eldest son, Edward, credited his parents equally for being noble, wise, and above all, godly, and instructing him in the fear of God. Now, Sir Robert characterised a Puritan as a man, inevitably, who desired to practise what others merely professed. And so I think this goes back to some of the comments in the panel this morning. They feel their Puritanism. His comments can be applied equally to both men and women, and they don't really circulate around theology. He doesn't mention theology head on. For Harley, a Puritan strictly followed all biblical commands and would do nothing in the worship of God or his daily life unless it was permitted by God's word. Now, in what I think is a very striking explanation of the nature of the Puritan conscience, Harley asserted that his sins are more than other men's because he sees them and greater because he feels them. And we can connect this to the many conversion narratives told by Puritans about their own spiritual awakening, such as that of Susanna Bell. Now, as I said earlier, these insights into this spiritual awakening or conversion they're often revealed in funeral sermons. Uh, it's very rare to get this kind of lengthy narrative that we got by Susanna Bell herself, by a woman herself, talking about her own uh, spiritual awakening. The implication of Harley's character was that if, if, if earthly law conflicted with God's commands, a Puritan would follow the Bible and his conscience to defy the law of man. So it depends what the test is. In a patriarchal society, this created obvious conflicts for women, whether they were Catholics or Protestants, if their religious beliefs differed from those of their husband. From the Reformation onwards, Protestant reformers advised wives that they must, uh, they must obey their husbands unless his commands were against those of God. But this advice invariably raised concerns that religious plurality would undermine patriarchal authority as wives picked and chose their religious beliefs. Unusually, the account of the godly life and death of the Lancashire gentlewoman, Catherine Bretter, published by two local ministers in 1606, approvingly discussed two occasions when she corrected her husband. And it's fairly mild stuff. It's nothing uh, very vicious. First, he got angry 
on a Sunday, on the Lord's Day. And she told him, oh, she said, mustn't get angry on a Sunday. So that was a good thing because she was being very pious. And secondly, she was a bit cross with him for collecting rents from a tenant who couldn't afford to pay. And she says, for then, you oppress the poor. And I don't know how they're going to get out of that, but uh, she obviously told him off. For women, the working of the Puritan conscience and the primacy of the Bible often surface during life cycle rituals, particularly at birth and death. And this is evident from a court case of 1603 involving the wife of Thomas Starr, a clothier of Ashford in Kent. And she refused to participate in the ceremony of churching, the official prayer book ritual marking the return of a woman to the parish community after childbirth. Now, there was some discussion amongst those who disapproved of this ritual about whether it was kind of purification of women or whether it was merely a sort of celebration of their return, having been sequestered for childbirth. Now, Mrs. Starr told the church court her conscience would not suffer or allow her to do so because she never read in the scriptures of any such kind of churching in women. Now, reading this statement against Harley's character, we can immediately identify Mrs. Starr as a Puritan in her appeal to her conscience and the Bible as justifications for defying the authority of the church and state as set out in the Book of Common Prayer. Now, as David Starr has noted, sorry, David Cressy has noted, refusing to be churched was a particularly female form of protest against the Book of Common Prayer. The rituals for baptism and marriage in the book also provoke challenges from Puritan women. Church court records contain cases of women refusing the sign of the cross of baptism, which Puritans regarded as a superstitious gesture without any effect on faith. And Harley actually alludes to that in his character. He says that Puritans object to the sign of the cross, the aerial sign, because they can't see what effect it has. We have an example from Norwich, of a woman, Elizabeth Cantrell, who was excommunicated in 1597 for withdrawing her baby at the crucial moment of signing. So she was holding the baby at the font and we got through all the baptism thing and then the minister wants to sign with the sign of the cross and she just whips the baby away at her arms and it goes nowhere. So she's excommunicated for that. I mean, it's not clear whether the baby is hers or whether she's uh, one of the gossips, the godparents or one of the, the midwives maybe, but she was not having this. Puritans also objected to the use of the ring at weddings, and John Earl described his she-precise hypocrite as marrying in her tribe without a ring. Now, it was, of course, possible for the laity to find a Puritan minister who would not carry out these prayer book rituals. And in this way, many Puritan laity escaped the attention of the church courts. This makes it very difficult to assess the extent of lay objections. And we've got a lot of writing by Puritan clergy complaining about these rituals, the ring, the sign of the cross, and so on. But actually finding the laity participating in that and challenging it is uh, less easy. Now, Mrs. Starr, like so many who were prosecuted by the church courts, also remains a relatively obscure figure. She was probably called Susanna, but like Mary Vere, Sarah Savage, and Susanna Bell, we are able to place her in a wider context of family and community commitment to Puritanism. And she came from Cran Cranbrook in Kent, and uh, there was a tradition there of using peculiar or Puritan first names amongst some families in the 1580s and 1590s. And both Patrick Collinson and Nick Tyack have written about this particular community and this particular practice. And it was encouraged in Cranbrook by the minister there, Dudley Fenner. And I think this shows the influence of Puritan ministers in their parishes with their parishioners. The parish registers at Cranbrook okay. reveal that three of Mrs. Starr's children were called No Strength, More Gift, and Sure Trust. Now, poor old Norse uh, No Strength died after a few months and you can imagine this is a sickly baby and they call it no strength and uh, in this parish her non-conformity was tolerated but it seems that she had moved to a new parish in Ashford very close to Cranbrook and that's how she ended up being prosecuted. One of her sons was a surgeon Dr Comfort Starr 
who emigrated in 1634 to Massachusetts, where he was one of the founders of Harvard College. And this was part of the great migration to the new world in the 1630s. And Comfort Star was joined on this journey by his wife, who came over later, children, and a sister. I had trouble working out whether this was a sister or brother. Truth shall prevail. So you can see why I had trouble. In fact, I'm not quite sure about more gift and sure trust, but there you go. <laughs> Susanna and her husband, Thomas, probably joined them a few years later. One of Susanna's grandsons in New England was also called Comfort. He later returned to England to take an active role as a Puritan minister during the Cromwellian period. So with Susanna Starr, we can see the growth of traditions of Puritanism within families that persisted through several generations and which were sustained by women as well as men. And that goes back to what Alex was talking about uh, yesterday, looking at clerical dynasties and also about generational um, <coughs> transition of these or handing down of these ideas. Mothers, of course, had an active and initial role as the first educators of their children. And the Puritan clergy addressed this audience by writing catechisms aimed at giving children a religious education. Okay. William Gouge, the minister of Blackfriars in London, was one of the most popular of these authors. His conduct book of domestical duties published in 1622 is the epitome of patriarchal advice to women to fear and reverence their husbands. And the funeral sermon preached the death of his wife Elizabeth in 1626 can be minutely mapped onto the advice given by William in his conduct book. She was a pious, prudent, provident, painful, careful, faithful, helpful, brave, modest, sober, tender, loving wife, mother, mistress, and neighbor. And of her 13 children, six sons, two daughters survive, one becomes a cleric, like the hus uh, her husband, and uh, they both support Parliament's Presbyterian initiatives during the Civil War. But I want to draw attention to the fact that Elizabeth was also a member of an entirely new and highly literate class of women, of clergy wives and daughters, which was created by the Reformation. And in her funeral sermon, she is depicted as being the acceptable face of Puritanism, but the acceptable face also of the clerical family. So she's a great Bible reader, like Susanna Bell. Elizabeth Googe's funeral sermon was the first that was published for a clergyman's wife, and it became a model for funeral sermons for other clergy wives during the 17th century. And there was a great premium on demonstrating the religious respectability of women in clerical families. Okay. Susanna Bell's account of her life uh, was uh, published with a lengthy introduction by Thomas Brooks, the independent minister, depicting her as a role model for the imitation of others as well. Now, it's only been possible to consider a few examples of women's expression of Puritanism here. I've argued that family networks and the life cycle can both provide fruitful context for a detailed understanding of the religious beliefs and influence of Puritan women on family and community groups. There are, of course, obvious parallels here with Catholic and Anglican women, but there are distinct differences in their expression of piety. The areas I have covered allow us to go beyond the high profile examples of the activists of the early days of Puritanism and the civil wars, and to consider how Puritan women molded a domesticated and respectable version of their religious beliefs for the imitation of others. Women were influenced by Puritan ministers in their parishes by reading works of practical devotion and conduct books, but for Puritanism to succeed, it needed women who could domesticate Puritan habits through the generations. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm sure there will be many questions, but before um, giving you the floor, uh, a quick update. Um, Alec Ryrie um, is stuck on a area there slash uh, bus. Mm -hmm. So what um, we suggest is that we take questions. 
obviously, given the title of Alex's uh, paper, Living the Puritan Life, I'm not sure what you, I would call that living the Puritan life, but mm -hmm. um, it's being stuck in there, but we'll see when it he, when he comes here. If he doesn't make it, then we will have more time uh, for questions um, about this paper. Please, who wants to start? Yeah. Um, I'm stuck in this comparative thing about Scotland and America again. <laughs> and I remember reading in my book that the um, adultery uh, in Scotland, hmm. when you look at the, the, the prosecutions, is something like absolutely equal between women and men hmm. in every society. And it's similar, apparently, in America. Hmm. Now, my one memory of adultery in, in, in England is that in the 1650s, I think, Parliament mm -hmm. passed an adultery act. Yeah. Uh, I think the most exciting group of it was to exclude MPs from the country. I didn't know that. Um, you know, <laughs> what you? Um, <laughs> um, is there uh, any difference in terms of the treatment of women, as far as you know, in England? Well, it's a big question, yeah. but there are very few prosecutions under that um, yeah. statute of 1650. Yeah. I think Jim Sharp says there's only three, uh, uh, I think, or some of okay. very low. So it's very difficult to yeah. tell. Very difficult. Um, I'm not sure about. Generally speaking, yes. Generally, policy and jurisdiction. About adultery. Yes. Well, adultery is linked to idolatry, isn't it, in a very specific way. So I think the Puritans have got a particularly negative view of adultery. And that's why uh, John Earl picks up in that, in his character of a Puritan, that in fact, Puritans are very negative about adultery. They see um, Roman Catholics who have crucifixes, uh, images of saints as, you know, being like adulterers, they're lusting after a false faith. And therefore that she's a hypocrite because she doesn't regard adultery as terribly important. So I think, I, I suspect there is a, a, a acknowledgement amongst non-Puritans that Puritans are very hot on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We've got a very similar question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, quite similar. Um, we started off uh, giving us portraits of uh, a lot of independent separate um, uh, women and then moving on to the whole family and then the closest uh, um, I, 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 individuals closer to uh, more Presbyterian vibe and I was wondering whether you could locate it and identify perhaps different ways of uh, of, of um, evolving as a woman within those circles, different, mm. uh, different different between the uh, the the, 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 the separatist, um, within the separatist movement and, and the Presbyterian one. Mm. Um, also, perhaps the, the way that gender is uh, is, is um, uh, lived and, and negotiated uh, within those uh, are there are there differences. Mm. I mean, that's an interesting question, because I think that often it's quite difficult to see where separatism starts sure. and, you know, who's going or to be a separatist. I, I, I see it more as a continuum, because yeah. um, if you take the example of John Davenport, for example, who was a minister in a London parish in the 1630s, increasingly in conflict with the authorities and then goes to... Um, Amsterdam and then to New England, at what point does he become a separatist? Because he's coming out of that Puritan tradition. He's very much supported by Mary Vere because she's got that kind of influence and money. And then he corresponds with her from New England. But there was no difference between their views, I think, before he goes. And I'm not sure that there's a big difference afterwards either. So I think there's quite a lot of that. And I think there is this very big premium um, amongst Puritan clerics. And I think this is the same in the independent groups and in the uh, Presbyterian groups on women being subordinate to men. It's only in these other groups, the sectaries in the 1640s, that you see female preachers. And that's quite, yeah, that's quite rare. And 
it, it is singled out for attack by the Presbyterians. They don't like it and they attack it. So there is that difference that uh, the point I made in the paper was that nobody actually took women preachers seriously enough to say they can now administer the sacraments. And there is this sort of fudging of they can talk to other women, but now they're talking to men. So that's where the distinction is. If they keep within the women's groups, within the uh, Baptists or the Quakers or whatever, that's okay. But the minute they start talking to men as well, then there's this alarm bell about patriarchy. So I think patriarchy in many cases overrides the sort of religious imperative. Thank you very much. Take advantage of my position as chair. Um, I wonder whether you could um, tell us something about uh, something that you mentioned at the beginning when, when you were showing uh, one of the um, fascinating pictures the, about the sexual undertones mm. um, of that picture. And I was thinking in particular, you know, you mentioned obviously, as you've just done now, um, the threat to not only patriarchy, but literally fatherhood mm. um, that these women posed, and also the fact that they uh, could talk and again, the, the practicing orders, and there was a kind of, um, you know, is a legacy, this idea that if women talk, um, the, the you know mm. uh, the work it's done so done is a is a classical uh, legacy in a way. Mary um, Beard there's a very a good article in the London Review of Books a few years ago about this idea of mutters. So I was wondering, given what you you said, the sexual undertone tones and the father, whether there are references to the Anabaptist. So in other terms, as a way of insulting or all comparing, mm. uh, we haven't mentioned Anabaptism earlier. Um, this this women's sex Anabaptism and what happened in Münster in in uh, 16th century Germany uh, is brought to the fore to decry uh, this also clandestine or clandestine element. Thank you. Yes, um, accusations of Anabaptism. I the ones I'm aware of actually occur in the 16 early 1640s when there's this kind of pulling apart all these different groups within what was perceived as a national church. And then suddenly all these groups are saying, um, we need reform of the church, we need reform of this and the other. And the royalist ones are saying these are Anabaptist groups uh, very clearly because they're trying to smear what the Puritans are trying to do. So there's certainly that element coming into the fore in the 1640s. And this? This, this is, um, yeah, this, this is from 1648. So it's uh, that period. Yes. Next. Comments. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you for your paper. Well, that was thinking about translation. What you said in the right book, is that I was like, Past couple of days, the difference between Puritanism um, politically, mm. and treatment to modest, best, mm. but socially and culturally. Mm. Is that where Puritanism's real effect on the Reformation is? Do you think at that parish level, the ability to change things forward? Is that where they really work? Um, well, some of these Puritan examples I've been looking at are, are very withdrawn because if you look at the Harleys, they're practically semi-separatist because they've got the church is right next door to their house in Herefordshire. Uh, they get to a point who the incumbent is and they are accused, uh, the um, rector in Harley in 1638, of devising farce of their own um, ideas, their own devising. So I think some of these, it depends where you are. So that would be a very Puritan parish where they could get away with that kind of thing in the Welsh marches. In other areas, it's much more difficult. I mean, the example of Mrs. Starr moving from one parish to the next and getting prosecuted in one parish and being tolerated in the other. But clearly she'd been very influenced by a Puritan minister. So I think that it depends where the impetus is coming from. In, the case of Mrs. Googe in London, the impetus seems to be coming from her to influence other women that she's seen as such a wonderful individual as a role model, that her neighbours respect her 
and that other people should read about her and follow her. So I think there are lots of different influences and it, it's very regional, it's very, you know, it varies from parish to parish how it works. One of the things I would say is that you get this in the Civil War period, we get a Puritan minister parachuted into a parish, has this wonderful effect, you know, his ministry converts people, they suddenly start observing the Sabbath. When he leaves, it all goes to pot. <laughs> So it's not very deep rooted. I think it's got to have some deep roots as well through generations. I think that's the point I would make. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. um, go ahead. If you have I was just wondering if you might say a little bit about the sort of the role have a particular style of manhood and history. Mm. Yes, I think it does. Um, I think it's very much this sort of rationality. And a lot of the advice in the Puritan conduct books is aimed at men about how to govern their families in a rational way that creates harmony. So there's a big premium on not using what we would call toxic masculinity. So William Waitley writes about husbands shouldn't use big looks, you know, puffing themselves up when they're telling their wife, children, servants what to do. And uh, William Gouge says the same thing. Um, there's also a lot about wife beating because uh, Gouge says, you know, you really shouldn't be beating your wife. It shows you've lost your rag, basically, and that's not what you should be doing. And William Waitley is the only Puritan minister who says that in extremis, when your wife is willful and she refuses repeatedly to obey you, you can punish her physically. So the, there's this very big premium on being, it's almost like sort of enlightenment ration, rationalism, you know, perhaps I shouldn't go there, there's a trajectory from Puritanism to the enlightenment. What, what these preachers and ministers model themselves. Yes. The old Testament patriarchs. Yes. Pictures of them with long beards, where they're really emulating, imagining themselves as Abraham. Yes. Yes. And um, there's this premium on these funeral sermons for clergy wives to prove what a wonderful domestic ambience they create for their husbands. And in Mrs. Googe's, um funeral sermon, it says she takes all the worldly cares from her husband. She looked after everything in the home so that he could concentrate on his ministry. And then you get that repeated in later funeral sermons as well, exactly the same words, because it shows how he can concentrate and doesn't have to be worried by the cares of this world with those a married minister. Okay. Um. Unless, yes. Well, give it a go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jack, this is probably another impossible question. Okay? <laughs> and one thing that struck me about so far is we not really tackle subjects and politics, mm. which is kind of important yeah. for Europe and stuff. Mm. Um, and it's a mindset which is very difficult to get your head around mm. uh, in the sense we dismissed it as. Uh, <laughs> and, and Puritan songs are the living in that. I thought I'm just sort of wondering whether you have anything, any comments to make on the important topic. I was also wondering, obviously, uh, in what way is apocalyptic gender? I mean, is, is, is mm. there, I've never seen any, is there mm. any difference between the male and the female appropriation of this or anything about this? You see what I meant by yes, yes, it is difficult, isn't it? Um, I'm very interested in this kind of millenarian thought because the Harleys were uh, millenarian in 1638. It all comes spilling out. You know? There were wars and rumours of wars, and this is the end. You know, we hope that there'll be a second coming of Christ. And Brilliana Harley is very clear about that. It's she who writes about it. So she's aware of this rhetoric. And the Harleys are connected to ministers who write about um, the apocalypse as well. Thinking of Bright, I think there's some kind of connection with Bright through the ministry. I can't remember exactly what it is. Tom, Timothy Bright, is it? Right, in the apocalypse, yeah. Um, so I think it, it is there. And 
it's provoked by the Thirty Years' War as well as a period where people write about it. But I, I haven't seen anything gendered about it. And I certainly don't think Brilliant is using it in a gendered way. And the, you know, I mean, the, the use of the imagery is gendered because of the War of Babylon, exactly that. And that ties in with the um, accusations of like, idolatry being like adultery and whoring after the whore of Rome. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Yes, of course. Now, I was thinking more of the individuals, actually, laity using that rhetoric. It's, it's very clerical. Yes, yeah. Hi, May. Uh, of course. I um, uh, had a question about the, uh, the political and political economy. You mentioned the Chile, I mean, the level mm. of movement yeah. on the hand, but if we uh, focus again on perhaps less heterodox or less controversial mm. uh, families, um, and, you, and of course, in, in the early session, you mentioned. Uh, the, the rebirth of um, of uh, a particular movement at the end of the 1930s and uh, mm. during the outbreak of the, of the civil war mm. in the early 40s. I was wondering uh, whether in, in those circles, what what role, what political role did women play? Uh, perhaps in in, the, in the, really the in the trying to in the, the support for those political activities mm. uh, uh, around the time of uh, the, uh, the short and long parliament mm. central, were there any uh, are there, is there any evidence of, of their participating within perhaps the, the, the household and mm. uh, relaying perhaps networking? I don't know. Well, the, 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 there's certainly a lot of information for Brilliana Harley. It's extensive. And uh, because her husband and son are both at Westminster, she relays information to them about what's going on on the ground in terms of politics, how the local gentry fall out. She's also involved in um, moves to get a petition to Parliament to, uh, against episcopacy. And she's also involved in a political campaign to try to get her son elected to Parliament at one point. So you, you can see a lot of evidence for that with gentry women. It's more difficult the lower down the social scale you go, obviously. One of the frustrating things is that I'm very interested in petitions to Parliament, but finding women's names on them is very rare. Um, I've got a case in Canterbury where there's a dispute about a royalist minister, and all of the people who signed the petition against him, some of whom are Puritans, are men, but <clears throat> there are six women who signed the petition in his favour. Which is very frustrating. So I can't find the sort of corollary of Puritan women uh, taking a stance there, but you can find royalist women doing it. Perhaps as a way of um, wrapping uh, things up, given that these, well, more than unlikely that it's not a survivor, we'll make it end for the benefits of the students, those who will take the aggregation. And obviously the question is for you, but is open also to others. Um, one of the organizers' um, points, which uh, we did not have time to cover, was um, the following. Uh, what are the new trends, historiographical trends, and perspectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Puritanism? In other terms, where do you think we should go next? Which I think is an important question and a fascinating one. And I wonder whether, you know, given your talk about gender, you might have something to say about it. And uh, likewise, the, the audience, you know, we haven't, for instance, mentioned whether Puritanism has a uh, global, there's a global term uh, to use one of the, um, you know, trendy word nowadays, um, whether it's something that we can only now, from now on study as something at the crossroads of different disciplines and so on and so forth. Thank you. And one of the things I found when I was thinking about what to say this morning was, I was very interested in women's opposition to the Book of Common Prayer, because again, we see a lot of clerical objections to the Book of Common Prayer. But in practical terms, how did women deal with it if they opposed it in a ceremony? And church court records obviously give us an insight into that. But I don't think anyone's done any extensive research into, um, for example, I, I found it difficult to find an example of a woman refusing the ring in marriage. Although it's written about by the clergy, 
I couldn't find a, a court case where either a man or a woman was accused of doing it. And I thought, well, how does that translate from what Puritan clergy are hot under the collar about into lay activity? And I think that there could be a lot of scope for more research because people look at church court records with a certain agenda in mind. They don't necessarily go to it to try and collect that kind of information. So you will get one or two examples of uh, women refusing to be churched or women refusing the cross in baptism. But that business about the ring was missing. So I think there might be some more work to be done on laity and their responses to the Book of Common Prayer. Very nice, thank you. Yeah. Alex, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I love to comment about that one I've been working on uh, recently, which is the link uh, between Puritanism and military. And uh, there's been a lot of work done on English military uh, activity, well, to be honest, English military violence uh, in, in Ireland uh, mm -hmm. in the 16th and 17th centuries. And, and, and that, by and large, has bypassed completely the, the issue of religion. They just see that they're violent bastards. Yeah. Um, uh, with many more. Um, and, but when you look at you know, the obvious violent bastard is is um, uh, George Anthony Gray, Gray Wilson, um, who uh, basically when he arrested all the the Spaniards of Smerick, um, he hung up the priest. I think uh, the soldiers had harbor practice on the priest for a day, but before he hung up the priest, he um, uh, cut off his fingers. Uh, I think. Um, and then they spent the whole day massacring two hundred Spaniards, and then the next day beating them straight with their weapons. Um, the um, th that kind of, of violence has always been seen uh, um, in political, military, you know, terms of uh, this is the nature of uh, the Thirty Years' War in terms of the extent of violence. But there actually seems to be. I mean, the work of David Craig, as uh, my life yes, I am. Um, uh, here is, is, is very important on the, the Calvinist military. And when you look at the Netherlands in the 1590s um, uh, and just people who moved between Ireland and, and, and the Netherlands, you can see that there is an apocalyptic Calvinist mentality amongst the English soldiery, uh, which surprised me mm. um, and can also be seen in Ireland. The way Lord Grey uh, justified the, the massacre of uh, the joint Spaniards of Smerik. Was he said they are uh, they're not entitled to the normal rules of war because they're vassals of Antichrist, mm -hmm. the troops were sent out of hope, mm -hmm. therefore we can go. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, you know, that one of the things I'm I sort of get into the how much internationally is the uh, the interpenetration between military activity and the justification of military activity by Europe and thinking about we're living in last times when the battle we're engaged in is not actually a battle uh, for military supremacy, you know, in Spain or the Netherlands or, or France or whatever. And um, it's actually a battle with the horses of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And you know, it will lead in the end, the end of the world. And that kind of you know gives you a different perspective on, on the military activity. And this was certainly the perspective the Puritans wanted to take when it came to the Thirty Years' War in the early 1920s, 1620s. Um, I, you know, I think it's an interesting connection. There's a recently, um, uh, well, PhD uh, thesis, which um, um, was awarded uh, less than a year ago, hopefully we've turned into a book from Helsinki University, somebody who's been working on um, Puritans, and uh, well, around Puritans and Royalists, uh, soldiers, and the concept of dehumanization through sermons. And it touches on uh, Ireland, as well, so I'll uh, give you name and address. And uh, <laughs> um, right, Sandrine, um, you are chief in command here. Um, <laughs> so uh, shall we? Uh, yeah. um, right. Thank you, no. Just what I can add is that Alec is uh, just told me that he will probably record his uh, a video of his presentation and send it to us, so then I can um, you know send it to everyone. And sorry about that. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, I, I'd like to, on um, part of everyone here, thank you for um, being here for excellent questions. And um, last but not least, once again, thank you so much, Jackie, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. You know, take balance, don't you? Yes, yes. You know, wrote about.